Lemonada. Okay, so I am looking at my high school yearbook and at my senior page in particular. For those of you listening, I don't recommend doing this. If you could see this photo of me, it is just so unattractive. (laughs) It's so unfortunate. It really is. I'm so somber. I look depressed while at the same time pretentious. So it's an interesting mashup of different um, horrible teenage characteristics. By the way, I'm also wearing a seersucker type of jacket, and I remember thinking, God, this is the chicest jacket. And guess what? Newsflash. (laughs) It ain't. Anyway, underneath, you know, everybody back then, I don't know if people still do this, but you put a quote or something that's supposed to sort of represent who you are or whatever. And so the quote I have under, <laughs> underneath my picture is from the movie Julia, which was a 1977 film that starred Jane Fonda and Vanessa Redgrave. And in the film, Jane plays Lillian Hellman. It's an incredible film. I loved it then. I love it now. And I wanted to look at this quote because I recently saw this documentary about Jane Fonda on HBO called Jane Fonda in Five Acts. And I was thinking the whole time that I was watching this doc, my God, this woman, Jane Fonda, she has done a lot of shit in her life. I mean, it was it was really riveting to me. And as I watched her, I was really struck by the fact that we just don't hear enough about the lives of older women. You know what I mean? When women get older, they become less visible, less heard, less seen in a way that really, it just doesn't happen with men. We are ignoring the wisdom of like more than half the population. It is just stunning to me that women, old women, and by the way, not even so old women, are so easily dismissed and made invisible by our culture. You know, fuck that bullshit. I want to hear from older women. And that's how the beginning of the idea for this podcast was born. I'm going to talk to old ladies. I want to know how they do it, how they did it. How do they navigate aging and life? Give us some tips from the front lines. And that's what we're going to do on Wiser Than Me. We're going to talk to women who are exactly that, wiser than me. And guess what? Today, we're going to be talking with Jane Fonda. I'm Julia Louis-Dreyfus. This is Wiser Than Me, a show where each week I get schooled by women who are wiser than me. tell anybody that I'm doing this podcast thing where I get to talk to women who have lived extraordinary lives and have lived long enough to become truly wise, the first thing people always ask me is, are you going to talk to Jane Fonda? Really? Yeah. I'm going to talk to (laughs) Jane. Wait, Jane, I'm introducing you. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm going to talk to Jane Fonda. I'm talking to Jane Fonda. Honestly, there's nobody like her. She's an actual American icon who has lived a life of passion, artistry, reinvention, controversy, commitment, and advocacy. She was at the absolute forefront of all of these huge cultural movements, the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, women producing their own work in Hollywood movement, the whole exercise aerobics thing. That was Jane Fonda. And now the climate climate crisis, and a whole new way to think about and talk about aging. Oh, my God. (laughs) And just mentioning the name Jane Fonda can still really piss certain people off. How cool is that? (laughs) She's the model of the kind of person we all need to listen to. I just can't wait to talk to Jane Fonda, who is oh so definitely wiser than me. Hiya, Jane Fonda. Hi. It's um, It's an honor to talk to you. It's an honor for me to talk to you. I I just, oh, my God. You know what I, just, I love? I'm watching you on Veep, and my yeah. grandkids are watching you on early Seinfeld. And 
You know, it, you cross generations. And when I told them, I'm sorry, but I've got to go upstairs. I'm doing a podcast with you. They freaked out. They were so really? excited. Isn't that great? Yes, it's fabulous. I'm so pleased. Yeah, I think young people are watching Seinfeld right now, which is yeah. completely bizarre. So are you comfortable if I say you're real 85. Age? I'm 85. 85. Yep. Hey, how old do you feel? Um, I feel 85 in, you do? My, in my body and mentally I feel much, much younger. But yeah. going back to when I was much younger wasn't so happy. So I don't really want to say that mentally I'm younger. I'm not. It's just that in spiritually and, and mentally and psychologically, I'm way younger than 85. But, yeah. you know, one of the things that I've learned as I've, I've gotten into serious old age is when you're inside it, as opposed to looking at it from the outside, it's not nearly is scary. Oh, wow. That's incredible. That's one thing. And the other thing is that num the number, the chronology of age um, is not what's important. It's health. You know, for example, my dad died at 76. You know, I'm on my way to, to 86 now, and I'm much, 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 much younger than he was. He was so old at 76 because he was sick. He had a heart disease. You know, I'm fine. I'm healthy. I've had cancer, but it's in remission. And, and you know, if you're healthy, 85 can be quite young. Yeah. Especially if you stayed fit, you know, and I, I move a lot. I just finished a workout. What kind of workout do you do, by the way? Slow. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, you'll find out. That's the operative word. I do kind of the same moves, but slowly and with less weight. I see. Yeah. I wanted to show you something because I think you're going to get a kick out of this. Well, you might. I say that. But <laughs> you see that picture? It's you. It's me. And it's my senior page. And the reason I'm showing you this is because on everybody's senior page, you put a quote. And guess what my quote was? Oh, gosh, what? <laughs> it, was, it was words that you spoke in the exquisite movie, Julia, that you spoke as Lillian Hellman. And I put it on my senior page, and now here I am talking to you. What did it say? Well, here, we're going to pull it up right now. And then I was hoping that you might read it. Yes. Old paint on canvas, as it ages, sometimes becomes transparent. When that happens, it's possible in some pictures to see the original lines. That is called pentimento, because the painter repented, changed his mind. Perhaps it would be as well to say that the old conception replaced by a later choice is a way of seeing and then seeing again. The paint has aged now, and I, I wanted to see what was there for me once. And what is there for me now? How about that? Well, that's quite a mouthful for your senior book. Wow. Yeah, for an 18-year-old, I have to I'm say. I'm impressed. Uh, yes, and maybe a little bit horrified because it's somewhat pretentious for an 18-year-old <laughs> to put that on her senior page. Yes. Are you leaving? I see you leaving. No. <laughs> have, <laughs> no. No, I'm not leaving. I'm looking for a quote that I like better. Oh, um, good. But Shit, I wish I'd known you back then, because then I would have used the quote you like better on my page. <laughs> All right. Here it is. This is T.S. Eliot, Little Gidding, mm. from Four Quartets. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's a much better quote for my senior page, Jane. I should have used it. God damn it. What a missed opportunity. That's a God fabulous damn quote. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a quote that I use at the beginning of Act 3 in my memoir. Because what I discovered as I prepared for my third act was you spend your life exploring, as I have, and what you realize is you go back to your girlhood and you become all the things that she was supposed to be mm. that you never knew at the time was really who she was because you were trying to be what other people thought she should be. That to me mm -hmm. was, was what, why I, I quoted that. Right. That's been your journey. Yeah. Can you define what the third act is? 
Yeah, well, I was married to Ted Turner. I was on a ranch in New Mexico, and I realized that I'm about to be 59, and holy shit, in a year, I'm going to be 60. And for some reason, for me, figuring I'm probably not going to live past 90, next year is the beginning of my last act. First 30 years, second 30 years, last 30 years. And, you know, you're an actor. You know how important third acts are. They can make sense out of the first two, right? Right. They're very important. It's kind of the legacy that you're going to leave behind. And so I thought, I have no idea what I want to do with my third act. And then it hit me. I know what I don't want to have happen. I know that I don't want to die with regrets when it's too late to do anything about it. So one thing that I want to do in my third act is make sure that when I do die, I've cleaned up everything. I mean, you always have some regrets, but it's not going to like make me feel bad when I die. And then the other thing is you can't really know how to go forward if you don't know where you've been. Yeah. So I spent the year between 59 and 60 researching myself very objectively, like it wasn't really me, it was somebody else. And what I discovered was that I'm really brave. I didn't know that before. I've been brave all my life. And that made me feel, it gave me a lot of confidence. I was a much more confident person at the end than I was when I started this research. So anybody that's approaching 60, think about doing uh, what I discovered later. It's a thing. It's called a life review. Psychologists, psychiatrists, gerontologists encourage older people to do this, especially older people who are depressed. Because one of the things that happens is that you discover, you know, a lot of who we are and how we behave and everything is because of how we were parented or not parented, right? Right, And right. And we always, because that's what kids do, we always assume that whatever happened, it was our fault. Right. And what I discovered and what people do discover when they do a life review was, guess what? It had nothing to do with you. Yeah. My father, whom you met. Yeah. A force, by the way. Yeah. A charismatic guy, but also a narcissist. Yeah. Which I think we have that in common in uh, our fathers. Yes. But a wonderful man in a lot of ways. Anyway, it 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 was his birthday or something, and he already passed. And my mom wrote me a note saying, you know, oh, because they were divorced and had been my entire life. And she wrote me this note saying, I know this is, you know, a day for you that you mark and so on. And, and I wish that there were ways that we could talk about what happened, you know, i.e. in our family and so on. And I wrote her back and I said, what's keeping us from it? And so when I was like 60, she and I went into therapy together. Wow. Yeah. That is so great. It was so great. It was such a gift. What did that do for you? It was a release as a a lot of things fell into place. Yeah. There was an understanding. I understood where she was coming from. Mm -hmm. She came from a a fraught family situation, and she understood what I was living through in my childhood with her and my father and my stepfather and my stepmother and so on. Yeah. And it was just, um, it was like ah, something opened up. I mean, I guess that falls under life review to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It certainly falls under the regret heading, right? Yeah. So when you're talking about regrets, what are the regrets that you've worked through yourself? I mean, it sounds like you've forgiven yourself, which is great. Not There's a few things that I haven't forgiven myself for and Uh that I can't really work. I was not a very good parent. What can I say? Mm. And I talk to my kids about it, or I try to. Yeah. And I... I, I try to understand why I did what I, the things that I did, and I, and I try to show up for them now in ways that I didn't back then. So that's the main way that I deal with regret. Are you a good grandparent? Uh, I am. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I like being a grandparent, but I can always walk away. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's sort of the perfect relationship in that sense. So um, would you say from your third act vantage point, what advice would you give to someone who's in their second act or in their first act for that matter? Okay, let's start with the first act. Yeah, let's talk about that. It's really, really hard to be young. Yeah. 
People always think it's hard to be old. No, it's hard to be young. Oh, it's, amen. Oh. I couldn't agree with you more. It is it is so hard. And I personally think that it's important to let young people know it's not you, honey. It's just really hard. And, and middle age is where you try to become an operative person. <laughs> and it's it's very charged. When you get older, it's like, oh, I've been there, done that. Didn't kill me. Okay, okay, dear listeners, this is Julia, and I'm cutting in here because the wildest thing happened right here when we were taping this, and I have to explain it to you. So Jane and I are having this lovely conversation, blah, 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 right? Well, you might remember a while back in California, we had what they called a bomb cyclone, which means a big-ass storm with an atmospheric river, and that storm hit right at this moment. And the power at my house, where I was on the Zoom call with Jane went out. Listen to this. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Did we lose power? Yep. Oh, Oh, fuck. That's such a bummer. Okay. I don't have service, and I don't have Wi-Fi. Wait a minute. Uh, Oh, wait. It's connecting. It's trying to connect. Why aren't my lights coming back on? God damn it. I can't call anyone. Fuck. So the power was out and I couldn't communicate with anyone. And as you can hear, I was freaking out. And I didn't know, though, that I was being recorded, by the way, because the tape recorder has a battery backup. Very clever. But what I also didn't know was that the power was still on for Jane. So she's still talking to no one because my power was gone. You know, you have a perspective and you discover, you know, you, you, you know, people are thinking and saying you're over the hill. But then you realize, oh, my God, but there's whole new vistas over the hill, other hills, other views that you just keep going and growing. That's Yeah. That's Meanwhile, happening. back at my house, this is happening. That's my alarm going off. Yeah, okay, so to recap, I've got no power, I've got no Wi-Fi, I've got no cell service, everything had gone completely to shit. Oh, but my alarm seems to be working just fine, even though nobody's breaking in. And my very first podcast is a complete disaster, except at Jane's house, where everything is great, with Jane talking to nobody. Do you know what I mean? As you get older, you realize the importance of being intentional. Really, that's why doing a life review is important. Understanding what things have meant in your life. You know, that's that's how you become wise. And so here's where Jane realizes what's up. I think I've lost her. Yeah, we have. One second. So sorry. Is it my fault? No, no, it's not at all your fault. You're incredible company. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. That's our producer, Rachel, who swooped in, and Jane was just so cool. It's not anything I said. (laughs) Not at all. This is incredible. She didn't hang up on me. She did not. She did not. Not at all. Your outfit is incredible. You look great in that color. Thanks. This is a Lululemon top. Lululemon is great. Yeah, so Jane Fonda is completely smooth and chatting about Lululemon while I'm freaking out. And when we realized the power was absolutely not coming back on anytime soon, Jane very generously agreed to record the rest of the interview another day, which we did. And you'll hear that after the break. Did you know that the plastic from shampoo results in over 500 million empty plastic bottles every year? It's enough to fill 1,164 football fields. I love products that do better than that, which is why Hair Story is a sponsor of this show. Hair Story has been founded on the principles of sustainability, and they take this seriously, producing a hair product called the New Wash that is 100% biodegradable and 100% in recyclable pouch packaging. Most people don't know that traditional shampoo is just not the greatest for their hair or the planet. I didn't know that. New Wash is a cleansing cream that cleans and conditions without the harsh foams and damaging detergents found in traditional shampoos. The luxurious result? Your healthiest, happiest hair ever. Hair Story does things differently, and it donates 1% of their 8-ounce new wash sales to water-related issues. 
It's so important that all of us do our part to make choices that benefit our planet. The hair care and cosmetics industry is really one of the largest in the world, and I am so passionate about supporting brands like Hair Story that do their part. Their products have a focus on having the lowest impact on the environment from the ingredients they use to the packaging they ship their product in. I love getting and trying the product and knowing that it's good for the world, not just for me. Try New Wash by going to hairstory.com and have your best hair day and support the environment. If you use code WISER at checkout, Hair Story will donate 10% to water preservation efforts and you'll enjoy 20% off your purchase. That's hairstory.com. Use code WISER. Many of us are always on the hunt for elevated everyday fashion. We want to be polished and put together, yet easy and effortless. It is a game changer when you find clothes that fit, that are tailored, that make you feel great, and that build your confidence while also being comfortable. Let me tell you about a little secret in women's apparel that you've maybe never heard of that will become your new go-to place to shop. Ever Eve is a retailer of women's apparel, accessories, and footwear, thoughtfully curated for fashion-forward women who are older and wiser. They have 96 stores across 33 states and offer an easy-to-use online store that will keep you browsing. Ever Eve has a wide selection of items with a constant influx of new pieces arriving daily. They curate the best pieces from over 150 of their customers' favorite brands, from their own Ever Eve label to well-known brands such as Velvet and Citizens of Humanity. I really enjoyed seeing their spring catalog and choosing items that were true to my style. For example, I do love my Birkenstocks, and I got two new pairs, one in rose and one in olive green. Between their beautiful online collection and their in-person retail stores, Ever Eve will become a go-to store for you to stay on trend all season long. Check out Ever Eve's latest curated styles and get 20% off your first online order when you use promo code WISER at evereve.com. That's Ever Eve. E-V-E-R-E-V-E dot com, promo code WISER. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. The conversations we have on this show, Wiser Than Me, are all about deepening our understanding of ourselves. Life is messy, uncertain, and exciting, and it pays off to have a lot of tools in your tool belt. Our sponsor, BetterHelp, offers one of those tools— accessible therapy. They directly connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on an ongoing journey of self-discovery. Therapy has helped me and millions of others find a better way to relate to ourselves and the world around us. BetterHelp offers both individual therapy and therapy for couples, and you can get matched to a therapist to support a wide range of issues with the same professionalism you'd expect from an in-office therapist. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Wiser today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Wiser. Hi, Jane. Oh, hi. 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 Hey, I got power back. Thank God. I was worried that you were going to starve to death and freeze. Isn't that amazing what happened? Oh Isn't that the God. most amazing thing? It was so bizarre. <laughs> anyway, thanks for taking the time to come back and continue our conversation. So can we talk about body and self-image? And I mean, you were this in- incredible aerobics pioneer. I don't have to tell you this. You know this. And so much of your life has been about fitness. Talk about your body now, if you don't mind, and what has surprised you about your aging body. I'm curious to know because as, I mean, I'm not a young person anymore and I'm surprised by what the hell's happening to my body for real. It's really (laughs) like, you're kidding. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm wondering what your experience is. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I am really grateful that I spent not all my life, but a good chunk of my life getting strong. Right. Because I have muscles 
even at 85, I'm strong. And yet even so, getting in and out of those really high up cars, yes, picking up my 3.5 year old grandson is hard. And yet still, you know, I'm surprised at how hard things get even when you are strong. But I have made peace with my body. It has gotten me a long ways. It's stood up for me. So I appreciate my body. I don't criticize it and hate on it anymore. And I... Oh, it's such a blessing. But I live alone, see, Julia. I don't have to show it to anybody. Yeah. I'm vain enough so that it would be hard for me to get naked in front of... Not if I'd lived with somebody 50 years, which I wish it had been my fate. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to get undressed in front of a new lover. Really? No, I've got too many nicks and, you know, scars and holes and all kinds of things. That, <laughs> I mean, I've got two fake hip and a fake knee and a fake shoulder and even a fake thumb. Fake thumb? How do you get a fake thumb? What are you talking about? They removed, I couldn't even hold a pencil. They, re, they removed a bone in it and replaced it with a cadaver's cartilage. Now it works Jeez. fine. Look at that. Yeah. You've had plastic surgery, correct? Yeah, I'm sorry to say, yes. Are you really sorry to say? Yeah, or do you- I'm sorry that I that I did plastic surgery. I am. I wish that I had been able to grow old at peace with my face, but mm. but I wasn't able to, and mm-hmm. um, I don't feel good about it. That's it's not real. I see. But I can't do anything about it now. Well, I think you look marvelous. Thank you. You're welcome. I was um, at a dinner once with Mel Brooks and Ann Bancroft. This Whoa. was before she passed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you ever get to? know them or meet oh, them you must well have. i mean i made a movie with her called agnes of oh, god course. and i of knew course. her because of the studio and lee strasberg yeah it was sort of at the towards the end of her life but i didn't know she was sick and i said to her Anne, you're such a magnificent actress which of course she was mm-hmm. and i said we don't get to see you anymore why are you not out there you're so wonderful and she said to me i can't look at this she said And she Mm. was referring to her face. Mm -hmm. And I thought, first of all, the most exquisite woman practically ever, in my view, absolutely gorgeous. And the fact that she was saying that, I think aging is hard for a woman in ways it is not for a man. And and it was, right? I mean, Greta Garbo retires at an early age, among many, many other great beauties, for the same reason that Annie's talking about, you know, and yet right. the, the guys go and they, you know, their jowls are hanging and there's all kinds of, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been hard for me to watch myself age on screen, that's for sure. I haven't even noticed it. Oh, thank you very much. So now you're single. Do you think you have to be single to be your own authentic self? It totally depends on your early childhood. (laughs) I mean, I unfortunately don't think that I can totally be myself in a romantic relationship with a man. I'm not willing to try again. The last time I tried was about eight years ago, and I just can't do it. I don't have it in me to really be myself with a man. And then when you were trying to do it eight years ago, what happened that made you realize, oh, I can't do this again? I I don't know. Since my very beginning of my life, I think I was conditioned to not be who I am in order to make a man love me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't want to do that anymore. I don't have time. Do you miss having sex with a man? Yes. But I tell you, after the season of Grace and Frankie, where Frankie and I created a a vibrator for older people. Everybody in the world sent me vibrators. I got a drawer full, so it's great. What's your favorite vibrator? Do you have a fave? The rabbit, the famous (laughs) rabbit. (laughs) The famous rabbit, right, Mm -hmm. okay. When did you know that it was like time to call it quits? When did you come to that conclusion, time to call it quits with a man? I usually know it that the relationship should end when I begin fantasizing about their funerals. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I plan their funerals, and then I realize, what am I doing? You plan the funeral. Are you speaking at the funerals? <laughs> yeah, I'm the main speaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, for some reason, when, when my relationships end, I always think of death. 
And it is kind of like dying to have a an important yeah. relationship end. I remember when I was working with the lawyers on my divorce with Tom Hayden, I put into the document that he's not allowed to speak at my funeral. See, in that case, I thought I was the one that was dying, and I didn't want him speaking at my funeral. <laughs> wow. Do you have anybody you want speaking at your funeral now? And I'm, I'm making a list. I'm making a list, yeah. Uh-huh. Not only that, but the music that I want played. I'm going to be buried in a shroud. I've already, I know where, in the same wildflower, wild grass filled, no headstones field that Tom Hayden is buried in because I don't want the children to have to go to two different places to talk to us and think about mm-hmm. us. So it's all arranged. I'm going to be wrapped in a sheet and put in a hole. And who's speaking at your funeral, ideally? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> this could be a whole... I'm just no. so, fasc- I'm so fascinated that you have the plan. I just love it. I know. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. So I get the sense you're not afraid of dying. No, not at all. I kind of look forward to it. It's like a new adventure. Yeah. You know it's a new adventure. I have a friend, actually, who just lost her mother, and her mother was so looking forward to uh, leaving this earth, and uh, because she'd been in a lot of pain, actually. And just about 20 minutes before she died, she said how excited she was to go. And then she says, oh, oh, my God, I haven't put my lipstick on. Oh, that's like my aunt. Yes. And she put her lipstick on, yeah. and then she died about 20 minutes later. Oh, I love Looking that. Good. I love that. I do, too. My father's sister, one of them, when she was dying, she also made sure to have the right lipstick on and, um, and the, the, a right, the right nightgown. Yes. Because of who she was going to see on the other side. See, I'm not so sure about seeing anybody on the other side, and I don't care about the lipstick, but um, I want to be able to have things to say to the people that are with me. I hope that there'll be people with me who care for me and, and that I, I won't just sh- clam up. My dad just clammed up. I couldn't get him to say anything. Really? Not one word? No. Assuming you get to see him again, you can uh, open up the conversation. I'd like to. Um, so in the documentary, you said, I wanted to be a good girl. A good girl is not an ambitious person. So how did you find your ambition? I don't know. I've never felt very ambitious, particularly. Really? For a long time, I just kind of went from one thing to another because somebody wanted me. I couldn't believe it. I, you know, I, The idea of saying no if somebody offered me a job seemed impossible. I was just so grateful that somebody wanted to hire me. Then when I started to do my own stuff, starting with uh, coming home, and in a way with Clute, even though I didn't produce Clute, I started to care more then about what I was doing. Right. I didn't look at parts in relation to what's this going to do for my career, ever. Well, I mean, as somebody on the outside looking at your career... I would say that this is a woman who is ambitious, and I maybe maybe the word is wrong. I also think that if you call a woman ambitious, <laughs> that can sometimes feel negative as opposed to when you call a man ambitious. Yeah, uh-huh. I mean, if you say, "Oh, that man is very ambitious," so in your mind you think, mm, "Success, he's powerful, he's successful." Yeah, so that woman's ambitious. You think, hmm, "Stay out of her probably way." Probably a bitch. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's yeah. why when 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 I was trying out for the lead role that Natalie Wood ended up having in Splendor in the Grass, Ilya Kazan asked me, "Are you ambitious?" And I said, "No." And the minute the word came out of my mouth, I knew that was a mistake. I could see it on his face. Oh, he didn't want that answer. No. But it's also not a very fair question to ask. And that mean, you know, anyway. Who says that any of them are fair? Correct. Patty Chayefsky once said to me, what have you ever done besides being Henry Fonda's daughter? I mean, those guys, they were, you know, they were never compassionate or anything. Who was a good mentor for you? who gave you healthy advice or steered you in a way that was good for you? I'll tell you what, I, you know, I was brought up to never ask for advice or help. And I erroneously thought that that was the way you were supposed to be if you were a grown up until I was about 60. And so I, no, I never asked for advice. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that seemed to me to be a weakness. But um, Catherine Hepburn, without my ever asking her, yes, gave me a lot of really good advice when we were making on Golden Pond. Like? Oh, like, I am terrified of going over backwards, whether it's a backward somersault or a backward dive. So doing the backflip was really, really challenging for me. Plus, I hate cold water and dark water. Cold, dark water on mm. a, in a backflip is my biggest nightmare. And I had to do it because Catherine Hepburn challenged me. And so when I was practicing, practicing, practicing and covered with bruises, I finally did it. And as I crawled out of the water, she had been hiding in the bushes and she came out, she came over to me, I was shocked. And she said, Jane, you've, you've taught me to respect you. You never want to get caught soggy. You always have to stand up to your fears. <laughs> never get oh. soggy. That was a really good piece of advice. Stand up to your fears. Wow. And, and I, I thought that was pretty good. And um, yeah, she wasn't a very nice person and she didn't really like me, but she, she was there. Wait a minute. What do you mean she didn't like you? Why didn't she like you? She told Dominique Dunn once, Jane Fonda has no soul. <laughs> well, she told me the first time I met her, she said, I don't like you. Anyway, there's all kinds of reasons, but she was jealous. Talk about competitive and ambitious. Oh, my God. I had to, really? you know, I, I realized early on that I had to be subservient and um, once I started being subservient, then she was nice to me. Did she know that you did a great impression of her? Because that's a great impression. No, <laughs> no, she didn't. I, you know, when when after the day after the Oscars, we were th all three. Me, my dad, and her were nominated. Yeah. And and I'd won two already. She'd won three. So if I won and she didn't, we'd be tied. <laughs> mm. But if I didn't win and she did, then she'd have four. And and I'd only have two. Right. Neither she nor my dad went to the Oscars. They were both ill. And I called her to congratulate her, and she said, you'll never catch me now. No. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. And how old was she? How old was she when she said that, Jane? A little younger than I am now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I know. It took me a minute to even realize what she was talking what about. What she was saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, th but then I got it. You know, talk about competitive. Wow. Yeah. Did she have a sense of humor? Was she like when she said that? Was she trying to be cute and clever? Or no, not really. No, it was just her. What she was really th that was her really what she was thinking, and she's she just couldn't keep it in. Oh, she was really competitive. Yeah, I have to yeah. say I don't like women like that. It bums me out. It makes me feel because there's a lack of generosity there. That for me, it stymies creativity. You know what I mean? I mean, there's nothing I love more than working with uh, generous actors and actresses. I mean, I get the sense that Lily Tomlin is incredibly generous. Incredibly. She's got a yeah. huge heart, yes. Huge heart, yeah. Mm -hmm. Female friendships are a huge part of your life now. Yes. Um, it sounds like they're kind of your life's blood in a way. Is it in this third act of your life that you realize the va the truly realize the value of female friendships, or did you sort of always know that? I never knew it. Oh, yes, it was only when I was older. No, I, I grew from from the very beginning of my life. As far as I was concerned, if I'm going to make it through life, I'm going to hitch my wagon to my father's star or to some other man's star. I've got to be with an alpha male, I didn't know that word at the time, but, you know, a strong man, interesting man who can take me into worlds that I'm not familiar with. And I had no women friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I gave birth to a daughter that I started very tentatively having women friends. And then when I became an activist, it was the women that I met here in this country, the women activists that were the most responsible for my new consciousness and transformation. It was being with them was like looking at the world, looking through a keyhole at the world that we're trying to create. They behaved like what we should all behave like with kindness and yeah. generosity and humanity. And, oh, my gosh, I thought, isn't that interesting? Men have never treated me this way before. 
these women, and there's, you know, three or four that, that, that specifically, that when they looked at me, I know they were looking at me, not at the celebrity. And I felt seen. And they asked me how I felt and what I thought about things. Men never did that. More with Jane Fonda after the break. One of my favorite things about accessories is that they can truly make an outfit. And for eyewear, we sometimes have just the one pair we're using, and there aren't a lot of other options to change up the look. And that is why I want to tell you about Pear Eyewear. Pear Eyewear lets you switch up your style in a snap with a base frame and customizable magnetic topper frames. You can swap your look daily to show off timeless looks or even find a topper to root on your favorite sports team. Pear Eyewear has glasses for everyone in the family. Kids love showing off their personalities and just imagine them being able to select their favorite color or topper frame throughout the week. And I love brands that also seek to make a difference in the world. Pear does that and is motivated to reach the 200 million children worldwide who do not have access to glasses. So for every pair you buy, Pear provides glasses to a child in need. Bring more color into your world this spring with Pear Eyewear. Go to PearEyewear.com slash Wiser for 15% off your first purchase. That's Pear, P-A-I-R, Eyewear.com slash Wiser. One of the best things about living in California is being close to the ocean. The idea of bottling up that ocean goodness is why I want to tell you about a sponsor of the show, Osea. They make an amazing product called Ocean Eyes Serum that is made from sustainably harvested seaweed. Osea has been making ocean-inspired and infused products that are safe for your skin and the planet for over 27 years. All their products are clean, vegan, cruelty-free, climate-neutral, powered by seaweed and conceived in California. So you never have to choose between your values and your best skin. Their Ocean Eyes Serum is a fan favorite and a great product for spring when you want a bright and fresh look. And what I love about Osea is that they are a family-owned and woman-founded business committed to making a difference. You can take care of your skin and the environment when you use Osea products. Spring into your most radiant skin yet with clean vegan skincare and body care from Osea and get 10% off your first order site-wide with code WISER at oseamalibu.com. You get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. Head to oseamalibu.com and use code WISER for 10% off. Did you know you could be listening to your favorite podcasts ad-free? How great is that? Whether you listen to podcasts in the car, on your commute, or while walking the dogs, Amazon Music wants you to have a seamless experience. To listen, just download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash wiser. Amazon Music is changing the way you discover and play the podcasts you love by giving you an ad-free experience. Download the app and listen to your favorite podcasts today without the ads. With their catalog of music and podcasts, Amazon Music is included in your Prime membership. You might be surprised to already have access to this amazing program. With Amazon Music, you get access to the most ad-free top podcasts. Listen to your favorite podcasts ad-free with the Amazon Music app or by visiting amazon.com slash wiser. That's amazon.com slash wiser. Do you think in terms of your activism and being an actor, do you consider yourself an activist first and an actress second, or are they on par with each other? How do you feel about that? They're on par with each other because, yeah. you know, when it's a good script and a good character, I love it so much. Me too. And it connects to, to my activism because it gives me a platform. I mean, listen, I have been an activist at a time when I had no hits TV series or or movies or anything, and how I was treated then, as opposed to how I was treated uh, with Grace and Frankie at my back, totally different. <laughs> Describe that difference. Well, police roughed me up. You know, I was called names, hair pulled out of my head in chunks, all kinds of things like that. Now that I had a successful TV series, um, I, 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 that didn't happen. 
Also, don't you think being older, too, is helpful? They're not going to pull hair out of your head. Well, it depends on where I go. I'm going to be spending a lot of time in the Gulf region coming up, so I'm going to see. We'll see what happens. What What are you going to do in the Gulf region? Well, the Biden administration has issued more than two dozen permits for new gas terminals in an area that is already buckling under cancer and heart defects and lung diseases because of all the the pipelines and refineries and everything in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And if these gas terminals go through, it's a climate time bomb. It's it's the end. It's a disaster. We have to stop it. So I'm going to go there with Fire Drill Fridays and film interviews and try to build opposition to this locally and nationally so that we can stop it. Biden should be ashamed of himself. I'm glad you're doing that. When are you doing that? Soon? Well, I go in June. I go in May. And then the second half of the year, we're focusing on California because, uh-huh. you know, we, we got Gavin Newsom, the governor, to, to sign a bill that was so important to create a 3,200-foot health and safety buffer between oil wells, fracking pits, and communities, schools and playgrounds and stuff like that. And now the oil companies have got a ballot that we'll vote on in 24 to undo it. I would like to be a part of the work you're going to do here in California. Wow. Well, that's a big deal. Well, I would love to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now I just want to ask you a couple more quick questions and then you can bolt and and get the hell out of here. Uh, Unless the power goes out and then I'll have to call you back a third time. (laughs) Good. Is there something you'd go back and tell yourself at 21? No is a complete sentence. Yeah. No apology after it. Just no. Just no. That's a good one. I love that. That came from, I'll tell you who, that came from Annie Lamont, who was um, doing a book signing in Atlanta. It was the biggest turnout for any author I had ever been to. I love her books. Me too. And somebody asked her to read a script they had. And there were like 2,000 people in the theater. And she said... No. I learned at AA that is a complete sentence. Oh, that's I love that. so good. I yeah. love that. I'm totally going to use that. Yeah. Speaking of saying no, is there something you'd go back and say yes to? You know, I often think I'm sure that there were a number of men that came my way who were perfect for me, who, would, who were not afraid of saying, come on, Fonda, show up. Mm. let's be real, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Show up. And could have taken it and could have revealed himself as well and didn't need drugs or alcohol or anything else to... And I wonder who they were. And if if I had been wiser, I would have said yes. I see. Yeah. This is not a question. This is a comment. I have to say, your hair color is stunning. Isn't it wonderful? And it's just my own hair color. (laughs) When did you decide to go gray? I just decided that I didn't want to have to keep putting chemicals on my head. So I said to Marta Kaufman, who was the showrunner for Grace and Frankie, Marta, I want to go gray. Can Grace go gray too? And so, you know, put it into the storyline. And we did. We had Grace gradually getting gray. Wow. I'm looking forward to doing that. I really am. I'm very gray. Is there anything that you want me to know about aging? As I'm, as I'm entering this third act of my own, is there anything I should know, Jane? Can you tell me from the front lines? Well, successful aging in large part depends on good health. So stay healthy. Okay. Posture is important. You can seem very old if you have bad posture, even if you're not all that old. And keep exercising. You've got to stay strong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just m- moving. Just moving. Just Walking. keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just adore you. And and I you. You know, it's funny. I fe- I just for the so the audience knows this. We both went to a huge mansion to celebrate Norman Lear's 100th birthday. And on the way I saw you and I came over and introduced myself and I assumed that we knew each other, but we didn't. We'd never really met before. You know what though? We did meet once very very briefly. At a, this was back when you were married to Ted, and you, it was at a global green event that Mikhail Gorbachev. Oh, I remember was at. that. I remember that very well, that event. But I'll tell you a story about Ted really quick. Yeah. 
I was seated next to him and he made a comment about all the money that we, him and me, had made uh, from the syndication of Seinfeld, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, actually, Ted, you know what? I don't own Seinfeld, so I didn't really make that kind of money. And then he reaches into his pocket and he gave me a hundred dollar bill. Oh, thanks, Ted. But that's Ted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was surprised that you looked so surprised when I came up to you and greeted you at that Norman Lear party. And, um, I think I was just waiting to become friends with you because <laughs> I oh, admire that's you so, so nice much. To hear. And so this has been really fun for me. This has been a really a big treat for me to be interviewed by you and talking to you. I appreciate it a lot, Julia. I do too, Jane. And I can't tell you what it means to me that you want to work with us on the California issue, oil issue. Yeah, I do. And you. I Thank admire you. you and have feel very, very uh, blessed to have been able to have this conversation with you. I just think you're an extraordinary you. human being. Thanks. And keep that power on. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll talk soon. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. First podcast completed. Oh. What I have to do now is call my mom. I got to tell her about this. Her name is Judy, by the way, and she's 89. And, uh, well, I hope she takes my call. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, Mummy. How are you? Okay. Can you see me okay? Yes. Can you see me? Ah, I can see you and you're blue. Mom, did you get new glasses? No, I can't find my other glasses. These are great looking, Mom. Thank you. Mom, I talked to Jane Fonda today. Oh, wow. I think I have a new really good friend, and I am not kidding you. I think that we became friends in this conversation. She's an incredibly interesting woman, and I think you would really like her. Well, she has done so many things. I, I don't even know where to begin because it was really such an exciting conversation. Actually, I do know where to begin. So I showed her my senior yearbook page because, wow. do you remember, I put a quote on my senior yearbook page, and it was from Lillian Hellman. I asked her if she would read it, and she did. She read it aloud. She must have been so touched by that. I mean, and you're so touched by it. That's incredible. But what she said was, this is a better quote. And she pulls a book out, and she reads the following from T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's so wonderful. Can you talk about where I started? Like, in your mind, are there remnants of who I was when I was young now? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Because there, there was a direction that you had innately, and it was sort of both improvisation, and it was what happened to you when you became a character when you were playing and you would be improvising. It was completely believable. Mm. And I remember when you were like five and we were, you were sitting in the back seat of the car and, and you would be having a conversation with Mickey Mouse. And it would be not just a little pastime, ha, ha, ha. It got to be, um, and I'm not saying it was a hallucination. It was something that you're, you were creating and it had mass to it. By the way, I remember being in the backseat playing Mickey Mouse. I think it might have been Mighty Mouse, actually, if I recall. Maybe, yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Not, not to split hairs. <laughs> but I do remember having an epiphany thinking, what if Mighty Mouse fails? What if he's got something to do and it doesn't work out? So I was sort of rewriting something. Anyway, I don't, it's, it's stayed with me ever since. Right. Well, that's very interesting because, I mean, I think all play is, is about life. Right. Don't you? Totally. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. All right, mommy, I have to say goodbye to you now. <laughs> I'm being told by my producers that I have to say goodbye. <laughs> well, well, I guess you have to listen to them and I say goodbye. Oh, and I'll also say I love you. I love you too. Very much. Okay. Very much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. 
There's more Wiser Than Me with Lemonada Premium. Subscribers get exclusive access to bonus content. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Wiser Than Me is a production of Lemonada Media, created and hosted by me, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. The show is produced by Chrissy Pease, Alex McOwen, and Oha Lopez. Brad Hall is a consulting producer. Our senior editor is Tracy Clayton. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paula Kaplan, and me. The show is mixed by Kat Yore and Johnny Vince Evans, and music by Henry Hall. Special thanks to Charlotte Chrisman Cohen, Ivan Karayev, and Keegan Zema. And of course, my mother, Judith Bowles. Follow Wiser Than Me wherever you get your podcasts. And hey, if there's an old lady in your life, listen up. Despite the messages we might get from society at large, it is actually such a wonderful gift to age. That is one of the motivations behind this podcast and the stories we tell. And it's why I'm so excited that Wiser Than Me is sponsored by Womanesp, the very first modern menopause brand on a mission to end the pause of menopause. And of course, it's founded and run by women. Womaness provides innovative products, essential information, and unlimited inspiration for women in their 40s, 50s, and beyond. Menopause is not just about hot flashes, but so much more like sleepless nights, mood changes, and drier skin. Womaness has a wide range of clean, tested, and affordable products to help women in menopause tackle their toughest issues. Women's health issues are too often unheard or dismissed, particularly when it comes to conversations about menopause. Womaness is working to change that by offering education, including a menopause quiz to help you get started. In addition to the community they are building, Womaness offers products like the Let's Neck Serum, a fan favorite that pampers the often overlooked neck area. These products are designed for all of the symptoms that women experience 40 plus and support us in becoming the wisest, best versions of ourselves at any age. Listeners, get wise and visit womaness.com. You get an exclusive 20% off on menopause solutions. Just use code WISER at checkout. That's W-O-M-A-N-E-S-S dot com with code WISER. Isn't it about time menopause met its match?